Today we're going to uh, actually finally get into our third regime on our stress strain curve. So we've dealt now, you are all experts in uh, elasticity, plasticity, and now we're going to get into fracture. So this should be linear. Then we have our plastic regime. So elastic, plastic, and now finally at once uh, fracture. So fracture is the fun part of mechanics. Uh, it's when things fail, when things break. So Fracture is the last resort um, for material deformation mechanism. So we are going to try to pull in the bonds. We're going to try to uh, basically move dislocations uh, in the plastic regime uh, in order to kind of accommodate and uh, basically deal with the stress that's applied on our material. And once all of the mechanisms creep, anything you can think of, once all mechanisms have been uh, exhausted, the last resort for material is to break bonds, and then you also form surfaces there. So once you break a material, so I'm pulling on my uniaxial tensile specimen, it breaks in half. I'm left with basically the material with two new surfaces. So why is this a last resort? Why? We know what happens. What happens to our delta G when we create surfaces? It increases. So we do not want to create surfaces, but that is the last resort to basically uh, accommodate and again, relieve that stress that's applied to material. So do not create surfaces. So, um, but again, that's when all of their elastic plastic mechanisms are dominated, that are uh, exhausted, that's when fracture occurs. So, uh, and the energy that's dissipated uh, is bond breaking. So when we talk about toughness or kind of that release of energy is by those breakings, the, uh, breaking that bond. So just like we saw for the theoretical yield stress, there's also a theoretical fracture stress. Um, so the th theoretical stress required to break materials, again, I won't go through that derivation, uh, but you could, uh, basically talk to me uh, in office hours, or I can kind of show you that derivation if, you, if anyone's interested. These are the theoretical, so fracture strengths of materials. So these are sigma F theoretical. So you can see here for steel, uh, for aluminum, and for silicon. Um, and add, just as we saw, that sigma Y theory was much greater than sigma Y actual. The same uh, thing applies here. So we see that the actual fracture strength right here, so sigma F actual, follows the same uh, behavior. So theory is much greater than your sigma F actual. Let me erase that. So your fracture strength. Now why is that? Oops. Let me go back to this big. <laughs> Let me scroll down a bit. Why is this? Uh, why did it happen for our yield strength? Well, we know uh, that uh, we know that we're still dealing with a material that, uh, again, uh, the way the reason why we saw that the yield strength theoretically was much greater than our actual yield strength was because we don't ever deal with a perfect material, right? There's dislocations, there's defects uh, that occur in our material. The same uh, the same principle, or the same kind of justification holds for your fracture strength. Uh, real materials will not only contain uh, basically dislocations, but they'll also uh, basically contain cracks. So these small, small micro cracks, either at surfaces or at interfaces, and these micro cracks will act as stress concentrators. So stress will be concentrated, stress will be higher, uh, basically close to this crack, uh, than uh, far away, you know, in the bulk of your material. So uh, that's kind of what we're dealing with uh, here. So. You can actually see for an elliptical hole, and we'll look at it, uh, that the stress will change depending uh, uh, on how far you are away from that crack tip. So let's take a look at this picture in a second. So this is our stress. So that sigma naught is the applied stress equals applied. So that's our applied stress. So far away from this crack tip at x equals zero, our material, it's just behaving like that's the stress that's applied. But as we get closer and closer and closer to this crack tip, to x uh, equals x prime, you see that uh, stress starts to increase kind of dramatically here. Um, so that is kind of the function of these stress concentrators. So that is why, again, all materials will contain, you know, these tips, you know, these cracks can be, you know, uh, on the orders of, you know, nanometers. So A, so your crack size. A can be on the order of nanometers or micrometers. And we're going to see uh, basically the stress required to fracture material will depend uh, on that applied stress there. So that is what we're dealing with here. So sigma, and that explains again why the uh, theoretical fracture strength is much greater than your actual fracture strength. So uh, now we'll just go ahead and continue on 
and figure out we want an expression for what is that theoretical fracture strength as a function of that. Because again, it will depend on the size of that crack uh, that we're initially dealing with. So let's figure out how we could um, get this expression. So one of, there's lots of different uh, theories on fracture mechanisms. A lot of them are kind of empirical, so again, evidence-based. But uh, one of the nice theories is this Griffith's theory of brittle fracture. So this holds, um, this theory holds well for basically ceramics, glasses, so basically materials that are uh, very, very brittle in nature, that don't yield before fracturing. So basically materials whose stress strain curves look like this, where they increase like this and then fracture. So basically we're almost elastic almost entirely up until fracture. Now for metals, this isn't a great uh, behavior because we know it yields prior to fracture there. So um, the Griffiths criteria is really, really, really good for stress strain curves that look like this one over here. So um, how do we how do we figure out what is you know um, how do we figure out an expression that gives us the stress at fracture as a function of the crack length? Well, we just kind of just talked about you know uh, the material fractures because it wants to relieve kind of the stress on those bonds right from pulling. Uh, but to do so, so that is energetically favorable. So to relieve any stored elastic energy. This is going to decrease delta G. But to create surfaces, we know that is going to increase delta G. So again, it becomes this competition between, once again, creating surfaces and relieving, you know, kind of some energy here. So that's always kind of your competition is this kind of two competing factors that are posing uh, when you're talking about thermodynamics and kind of uh, these uh, derivations and expressions. So how much surface area are we creating uh, for these microcracks or to kind of open that crack. Well, let's take a look at this example right here. So I am creating two surfaces. So one that's right here and one that's right here. Also, this material, it's basically three-dimensional. So I'm going to kind of draw it as I can. So this crack basically propagates, you know, from here all the way here through basically this side here. This is going to be the thickness of your material. So the change in uh, or energy, the delta U, again, here, um, you could use delta U, you could also use delta G, uh, not, you know, but you'll see this kind of delta U surface um, more commonly in literature. So um, don't uh, don't show your uh, thermodynamics professor this expression, obviously. There are very, very different things, but anyways, we're going to work with uh, the change in internal energy. So the change in internal energy of our system, again, free energy essentially uh, in our kind of notation that we've been dealing with uh, previously. So we are going to create two surfaces. So 2A, both of these sides. So we're going to create 2A here, 2A here uh, on both of the sides of the expression. Uh, and it's going to be multiplied by the thickness of your material. So you can kind of approximate it as this kind of, you know, crack like here. And it will be 4 times A times T. So 4A again, two surfaces here, two surfaces here. Uh, again, propagated in through the thickness, and we're going to multiply by our surface tension or surface uh, energy. So what were the units again of, because uh, we, we want to, and we're dealing with internal energy of our system. So A times T, that's going to be meter squared. What were our units of gamma, our surface energy? Joules per meter squared. So joules per meter squared times meter squared units of energy. Excellent. So this is going to oppose. That's why this energy, again, is positive. Now, what is going to drive uh, crack formation or crack, you know, forming a crack? So this, this term here is positive energy. It is going to oppose creating a crack. So we don't want to create new surfaces. So we're going to oppose this for as long as possible until this factor, which drives crack formation, so overcomes this opposing force. So when this becomes bigger than this driving factor, then we're going to crack our material. So to relieve the bonds, again, this derivation is kind of meant for materials that look like this. So to relieve my internal energy, I need to look at, again, relieving the stored elastic energy in our material. So our elastic energy, so for this type of material, it is going to be, again, we're going to multiply. Uh, so what is the area under this curve? It is going to be simply our, or our stored elastic energy. So U elastic, ELE, or elastic stored energy. If you remember back to the beginning of this lecture, we had that expression that... Um, your stored elastic energy or elastic strain energy, ESE, is going to be volume times integral from zero to here. In this case, uh, it basically fractures and breaks right at uh, our previous expression had it to the yield. But again, 
For these materials like glasses, they're going to break essentially right as they yield. There's going to be very little distinction. Times your sigma times T. So how do I rewrite this expression? Well, I know that in this regime, if I'm an elastic, and if I'm pulling my material like this, I can use my uh, Hooke's Law. That's the only time we could use it without using that tensor notation. So what is my volume also uh, in this material? So it's this elliptical crack. So you can kind of approximate it as like this, uh, you know, you know, circle approximately. So you could just say that the volume is equal to pi times a squared times t. So that will be the volume. And now you just kind of rewrite uh, and reuse this expression. So if you kind of uh, work this out all the rest of the, uh, the way, actually I'll show it you in a second. So u e l e is going to be uh, from the integral of volume pi a squared t times integral p sub f of e epsilon dE. We could do this integration, and that will eventually lead you, let me erase this here. So if I integrate that, I know that I will be left with uh, this equals pi a squared t times e times e squared over uh, 2. And I could also, again, rewrite this in terms of, again, because I want my expression, the whole thing we're trying to uh, get at is sigma f as a function of a. So I'm going to replace epsilon now. We know that epsilon, again, from our Hooke's law is equal to e epsilon. So it's going to be sigma over e. So I'm going to replace that in here. So this becomes, uh, I wonder, sorry, I'm going to erase once again. Just give me some more space. So you can rewind this video to kind of show the rest of those drawings if you need them. This is just math at this point to show you the derivation. Um, so I'm going to plug in here. So pi a squared t e times sigma squared divided by 2 e squared. And what are you left with? E's cancel here, here. And it's negative because, again, this is the energy that, or this is kind of the favorable interaction that's occurring here. So that's it. That's how you get your expression. Pretty hopefully straightforward. Now, if we want to figure out what is the critical crack length that will minimize my total energy, I'm going to set this, uh, these, two com uh, these two contributions equal to zero. Uh, these, again, are the change, uh, essentially, in free energy of our systems. So once I set those to zero, I'm going to re-solve. Um, so we could kind of see this right here. So for a t, gamma is equal to i a squared t sigma squared i by 2 t. So this becomes here, 2. Uh, let me erase once again. I'm going to move that over. And I move... Uh, divided by a squared, so I'm going to move this over. The t gets uh, canceled out, so I'm going to end up with the a here. Here is gone. I'm going to divide by pi, and I'm going to move the e over as well. And that's it. And then I'm going to get the square root out of there and the square root all of this. So that's a mess, but this is not. <laughs> so that is your, uh, essentially, fracture strength of your material as a function of what is that initial crack length? So if you know sigma f and you know all the rest of these parameters, you can figure out what's the critical crack length. Or if you're trying to figure out what's the fracture stress required to break my material, if I know my uh, Young's modulus, if I know my surface uh, energy, and I have some arbitrary value of a crit, you just plug and chug, and you'll figure out what the, what's the stress, or what is the stress required to break that material? Not the stress, the stress. Yeah, so that's group of the criteria. So, this is a nice and powerful equation. There's two others uh, that we're going kind to of talk about in fracture mechanics. So we just mentioned before that uh, the Griffith criteria is for really kind of uh, ceramics and really brittle materials that basically are linear uh, and elastic right up until the point of fracture. So there really is almost zero or very minimal um, kind of yielding occurring in here. So um, if I want to figure out uh, how to describe other materials like metals, that are going to look like this and yield considerably or even worse polymers, I'm going to have to take into account this idea that the it's not going to fracture completely brittly. We're going to basically yield prior to each little crack elongation. So the picture that we're kind of dealing with here 
is each time before this crack elongates, uh, I am going to plastically deform and yield uh, my material uh, before each that crack basically propagates further. So this is you'll see this in kind of literature like this is called the you know plastic deformation zone. So it will yield plastically a little bit before that crack you know elongates. So um, or one we've kind of hopefully we we've discussed him a little bit before a lot you know you'll hear his name a lot in terms of dislocation theory, but he developed uh, kind of a very similar theory. Uh, and you see the expression is very similar, except instead of our uh, our surface energy, he introduces this term G sub C, which is the strain energy release rate. So you'll want to use this theory for more for metals and plastically deformed materials. So you could probably use this a little bit for polymers, although, um, again, take my MEC 202 course. We'll talk a lot about fracture mechanisms of polymers or take a course specifically dedicated to that. It's a little bit different. But um, this equation you want to use for those materials. But again, very similar theory, same ideas, same concepts going on here. And the last uh, kind of uh, theory that you'll kind of come across is this kind of value of fracture toughness. Um, so basically, it comes uh, it comes from this idea that the fracture toughness considers uh, when there's this critical stress intensity factor, um, and it depends on this critical stress intensity factor will depend on the mode of fracture. So you'll see these values like K uh, is K one C, not I. Uh, I've used that. I've <laughs> made that mistake many many times uh, in very brutal. Uh, public humiliated fashion. So you want to say K1C, K2C, and K3C here. So these are just the modes of fracture. And when, once you hit this critical stress intensity factor, again, this is kind of a more, you know, you could kind of see this derivation. It's a little bit more, um, I'd say, empirical uh, in nature. But um, this is another expression that you'll use. So F is typically a geometric constant. Um, typically, we'll set F to equal to 1. Again, not we're interested in the scaling behavior. Um, and you could rearrange again. It's, it's saying for a given stress intensity factor, for a given critical crack size length, what is the stress to fail? Or, you know, again, it's rearranging these expressions. Fracture is fairly straightforward. You just kind of want to see what values are given, and you can kind of rearrange and solve um, for what you're looking for. But again, it depends on the materials you choose um, and several other parameters here. So the mode or kind of the method of loading, you could see kind of the crack modes here. So this is pulling on this sheet of paper. So this crack is going to kind of decrease, go here. Here I'm going into the board and then out of the board here. Um, actually, excuse me, um, I had myself. Here I'm just pulling up here and down here. So uh, and it's that crack that is again going to propagate you know down this way. And then here I'm going to go into the board, out of the board, and then again the crack goes there. So those are your three crack modes. And again, those values will kind of change um, depending on these crack you know this mode of loading or this method of loading. But again, it'll change you know fairly minimally. Um, usually, we'll deal with uh, K1C type of loading. Um, so that will be kind of the typical one you'll see here. But yeah, so that is the basics of fracture in a nutshell. Um, we are going to get into fatigue next. Um, so uh, yeah, brittle materials, also BCC, uh, is going to uh, fracture much more differently. FCC will typically yield beforehand. But anyways, um, those are really, really um, subtle distinctions. But anyways, next time we're going to get in fatigue, and then that's going to finish us up for mechanics and for exam two. So um, please let me know if you have any questions. I'll be happy to provide more information if anyone's interested. And uh, yeah, that's it. Have a great day.